Uh, this morning's lecture is uh, on the pricing of the factors of production with some particular application to and examples from the labor market. And just as a reminder, uh, the kind of analysis that we've been doing this week, so-called causal realist uh, economic analysis, uh, has the objective of deriving uh, universal laws of social interaction, what Carl Menger called exact laws, that are very general and applicable to a wide variety of situations. Nonetheless, from the most basic uh, economic principles, we can derive many uh, uh, additional applications and examples uh, that take the general rule and apply it to particular cases, uh, particular sets of circumstances. And so we'll, what we want to do this morning is start with the general principles of pricing uh, that we discussed yesterday and extend them to talk about a specific case of economic goods and services that are priced in markets, namely not consumer goods or final goods that are enjoyed or consumed by the end user, but rather what, uh, intermediate goods or what we call factors of production, goods, economic goods that are used in the production of other goods. So let me just kind of remind you of the basic setup here. Um, what are economic goods? Joe discussed this on Monday. Uh, economic goods, we can think of them most generally as scarce means that are employed or used to achieve the ends of individual human actors. Okay? So, uh, you know, this bottle of water is an economic good which I use, if I drink it, I'm using it to achieve my end of quenching my thirst. Okay? Or I could put it to some alternative use, like splashing somebody in the audience with water to wake them up. That would be my end of which this is a mean. But we call this a, cons a means. We call this a consumer's good because it, it, its services are consumed directly. Um, what we call producer goods or factors of production are goods that are used in the process of making other economic goods. Okay, so for example, land. And when the economist speaks of land, he means not just sort of land in the common everyday sense, but the part of land or nature that is nature given or God given, not the part that is improved through human activity. And we'll talk about that distinction a little bit more later. So really by land we mean natural resources, uh, unimproved land and so on. Factors of production that we simply find around us and we don't have to go to any effort to create or discover. Um, labor, the services of human effort, uh, is uh, a producer good. Why? Because we don't consume labor directly. We employ labor to produce bottles of water and other goods and services that we do consume. Okay. And finally, producer goods or capital goods, what we, think, what we can think of as the produced, produced means of production. Uh, so we mean things like tools, machines, buildings, etc., which are themselves made out of land or natural resources and labor. Right, Joe made the point uh, the other day that when we create capital goods, we can, we can use the word create, but really what we're doing is rearranging or transforming the, sort of the primary factors of production, natural resources, and labor to make some intermediate good that is then used in the process of production. Okay, so land, labor, and capital goods as three different categories of producers' goods, producer goods. Now, what, what, is, what are some examples of consumer goods and producer goods? Or what makes something a consumer good or a producer good? Notice that it isn't anything sort of intrinsic in the physical characteristics of the good that make it a producer good or a consumer good. It's purely subjective, meaning how a good is used in an individual's plans, economic activities or plans. Okay, so you know, consider bread, for example. If we put this in the terminology employed by Carl Menger, the notion that goods have different orders, right? If you think about what goes into the production of bread, if I consume bread, uh, uh, then, then the bread itself that I eat is the final consumer good. And you can think of a series of intermediate goods. We start with soil and seed and water and fertilizer at the first stage. Those are then made into wheat by application of human labor and some capital goods. The wheat is transformed into flour, the flour is transformed into bread. Okay, so in Menger's terminology, as we move up the scale towards the original inputs, we call those higher order factors or higher order goods. And then as we move down the scale towards the end consumer good, Menger calls these lower order 
uh, goods and services. So the higher order goods are employed to create the lower order goods. Okay? And while certainly there is a, a, a physical or objective manifestation of the relationship among these goods, right? we don't just wish into our minds that flour can be made into bread. It is objectively true that flour can be made into bread. Right? But it's the fact that I consume the bread that makes it the lowest order good in the scheme. For example, um, I like to buy fresh baked bread from the bakery at home rather than, you know, sort of sliced bread that you get in a, in a Wonder Bread or whatever. Uh, but, you know, the drawback of buying fresh baked bread is that because it doesn't have as many preservatives in it, uh, it goes stale more quickly, right? If you don't consume it in a day or two, it gets kind of hard and crusty. Well, I mean, you can throw away your hard, crusty bread, or if you're clever, you can make it into croutons or, you know, dressing or stuffing to put in your Thanksgiving turkey. Okay, so I like to make homemade croutons out of my stale, crusty bread, right? So we can imagine a production process where I start with the same higher order goods. I use them to produce, they're used to produce wheat, flour, bread. Then the bread is transformed through the passage of time and not much human labor, I guess really neglect, uh, into stale bread. And then the stale bread is transformed into croutons by cutting it up and toasting it and adding some garlic and some herbs. Mm, it's really delicious. Um, so the point is that the, the bread in this example is exa exactly the same physically as the bread on the previous slide, but now it's become a higher order good. It's become an intermediate good rather than the final good simply because I've changed my subjectively determined production plan. Okay? Uh, we can imagine even another example where bread is served in a restaurant. Right? So the final good that's consumed in the restaurant is the meal, right, of which the bread is a component. Right? So from the restaurant's point of view, the bread is an intermediate good. It's a, it's a producer good. It's not something that the restaurant owner consumes. What the restaurant owner consumes is the income received from the uh, patrons of the restaurant. Okay? The patrons consume the meal itself. Okay? So again, exactly the same bread. The bread is the same in all these three cases. But where it fits in the production scheme depends on the purposes of the individuals involved. Okay. Um, overview of sort of the, the, the basic principles of the pricing of factors. I'll start with the overview and then we'll go through some of these points one by one in greater detail. Okay. So a most, the most general statement, which I'll just, uh, I'll just give it to you now and then we'll explain in more detail where it comes from is that the rental prices of factor services that are rented, okay, so the price that you pay for the use of a factor service that belongs to someone else, okay, rental prices, and the purchase prices of factors that you can buy outright, okay, are determined by demand and supply in factor markets. Right, just like the price of the car radios in my example yesterday is determined by demand and supply in the market for car radios, the same applies to the prices of consumer go uh, producer goods. And notice we need to make this distinction because many producer goods can be either purchased or rented. Okay? So if you think about uh, you know, yard tools, if you need some kind of a digger and you don't own the digger, you can go to Sears or you can go to the rental center and you can rent it for a day. You pay 20 or $30 to rent its services. Well, you're still consuming, you're using the services of, of a producer good, but you're renting it on a per hour or per day basis. Right? Or you can go to the hardware store and purchase the digging machine yourself. Okay? And we'll explain a little bit later how the purchase price of the machine is related to the rental price of its services. There are some intermediate goods for which purchase is not possible, such as labor services. Right? You, you rent the services of your employees. You don't purchase them outright. Right? Now, one can imagine, hypothetically, and of course historically, a society with slavery, with legal slavery. Right? Then the purchase of a slave would be analogous to the purchase of a machine in the factory markets. 